Thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Um, my name is Todd Lando. I'm uh, the executive coordinator at FireSafe Marin, and I'm here with Rich Shortall, the president at FireSafe Marin, and our Firewise USA liaison, John Hansen. Um, thanks for attending. Appreciate it. You have an opportunity during the presentation to go ahead and use the Q and A feature or the chat feature to uh, chat primarily with Rich and John. If you've got questions, feel free to ask them through the Q&A um, and we'll do our best to answer them at the right moment during the presentation. Uh, probably most of the questions will be answered at the end. This is gonna take about, about 45 minutes or so um, and, and we'll take as long as it, it takes afterwards to answer your questions and uh, open a discussion with all of you in attendance. Um, Give me one second to share my screen here and bear with us if there are any technical difficulties. This is only our second time using the, the webinar feature on Zoom. Um, a lot of intricacies and we're still learning. We, we don't quite have a grasp on all of the, the features that are built into this. So. Okay, everybody should see my screen at this point, I hope. Uh, John, can, you, you can good. see? Good. All right. So th this is part of FireSafe Marin's Living with Fire Education Seminar uh, Series. We've done this in a live presentation format for several years now. It's usually about a 90-minute to two-hour presentation um, where we discuss uh, topics that are relevant to Marin residents. We cover evacuation, preparedness, personal safety in wildfires, we cover uh, home hardening, how homes ignite during wildfires, what you can do to, to protect your home. We cover defensible space, the concepts of managing your landscape, uh, your plants, uh, vegetation, and hardscaping around your home to protect your home from wildfires. And then we talk about um, community organizing, specifically, usually the Firewise USA program. So tonight, we're just going to cover home hardening and what we call zone zero. It's the non-combustible zone that we recommend and that, that uh, the fire science community recommends around homes. We're gonna talk about that in more detail than we ordinarily do, cover it in about 45 minutes. Um, before we, we get into that, I want to ask that every Marin resident who's uh, in, attendant, view, in attendance viewing the meeting, um, uh, register for Alert Marin if you're not registered already. If you are registered or you think you're registered, please go ahead and um, log into your account at Alert Marin, verify all of your contact information, and, and run a test message through Alert Marin. This is Marin's emergency notification system. It's how uh, you'll be alerted during an emergency, during a wildfire, uh, any type of fire or other emergency that affects your neighborhood. Critically important that everybody in Marin register today. Thanks. <laughs> Marin County has a long history of wildfires. We've been spared the last few years as our neighbors in Sonoma County have been inundated um, uh, with really catastrophic fires in 2017 and again in 2019, the Camp Fire in, in uh, uh, Butte County. Oh, but, but obviously are the events that are on everybody's mind, but we, we want to remind people that Marin has a long history of catastrophic wildfires also. 1919 was our, our first urban conflagration that burned dozens of homes in Sausalito. 1923, Marin's largest fire burned hundreds of homes and about 60,000 acres uh, through the middle of the county, started in Nevada, burned all the way to uh, Bolinas near the ocean. 1929, the Great Fire in Mill Valley. 1945, the Old Mill Fire, uh, Samuel P. Taylor Park, or where the park is today. And then the Vision Fire, 12,000 acres. It was the largest fire in California in 1995, destroyed 45 homes. Uh, these are significant events. Um, uh, that history plays into the fact that Marin was the first to county uh, uh, in the nation to create a forest firefighting district, a firefighting uh, department, fire department that was dedicated solely to fighting wildfires. Um, and, and as we talk about our major fires, the fires in Marin's history and really all of those major fires in California history, it's important to emphasize that they happen typically under a specific set of weather conditions. Um, when the National Weather Service has issued a red flag warning, uh, usually predicting 
uh, is strong, strong, dry north or northeast winds. Um, these are the conditions that have driven all of those major fires in Marin's history. And, and it's important to know that because these conditions are predictable. Uh, when the Weather Service issues a red flag warning, you really need to perk up and, and listen, pay attention, go through some of the steps that we talked about during our last presentation on personal preparedness and safety, evacuation preparedness, go through some of the steps we'll talk about tonight when we talk about um, how to protect your home in zone zero. So we're gonna cover uh, really briefly in some ways the topic of home hardening, how, what, what, how to build features into your home, how to engineer, design, and even retrofit an existing home to harden it, to protect it from the flames or the embers from a wildfire. Um, you can build a home that will survive wildfires. This is the video that's showing in the background there is a, a, a home that was impacted by two major fires in a 12-month period in Napa County. It survived both of the fires essentially undamaged, largely because of the choice of uh, design, engineering, and materials that were built into the homes. Looks like an ordinary home, a, a nice ordinary home, but, but the, the fact of the matter is uh, uh, this is this is really proof positive that we can build a home that will withstand even the most destructive wildfires. Uh, when we talk about homes and the concept of uh, protecting your home, you need to understand that most homes are ignited by the embers that blow in front of a wildfire and not from the flames of the fire itself. Um, the wildfires, they, they generate billions and billions of embers. They, those embers can be carried for miles potentially in front of the fire by wind. Um, and importantly, embers are one of the easiest things you can protect a home against or any structure against during a wildfire. The, the steps, the things that you need to do to protect your home are, can be relatively simple and inexpensive, sometimes even free. Um, <sighs> images like this are common. This is a home that burned during the, the campfire in Paradise just 18 months ago. And when you look at this, it's, it's really important to focus on what, what you're seeing. This, this is a home that was destroyed by embers. You can see that the vegetation surrounding this home didn't burn, it never burned. This home was destroyed because embers from the fire that was miles away landed on the home, found some type of receptive surface or material that could ignite, it was ignited, the home was burned, the vegetation around it survived intact. Um, I'm going to show a couple short videos just, just to give people an idea of what it looks like when embers fall and give you a concept of what you're protecting your home against. This is important. Um, I, this, is, uh, this is during the campfire. This was uh, video footage from an Alameda County Battalion Chief's uh, vehicle, a, a dashboard mounted camera. You can see the tremendous number of embers that are blowing. Uh, I, across the road, great, great distance. In this case, you see on the left-hand side of the screen, the flames from the fire, but it's really the embers that cross the street, not the flames of the fire. This is one of the best illustrations I've seen. This is from just six months ago, the Kincaid Fire in Sonoma County. Take a look at the embers and watch what they do here. Eyes on fire right now. The embers raining down all around us now. Look at all the spot fires that they've handled just now. Those spot fires are what we're looking at. Pretty incredible. Those all developed in the time he took turned to the camera away from the sky. <sighs> So we understand that it's the embers that uh, ignite homes anywhere from, no, having a little difficulty getting the right slide to play here. We understand that it's the embers that ignite homes anywhere from 60 to 90% of homes that are destroyed in wildfires are destroyed by the embers and not the flames. It's been a tremendous amount of laboratory research. In fact, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Steve Quarles um, formerly of the IBHS and the UC Cooperative Extension, uh, uh, sitting on the board of directors at FireSafe Marin. This is what you're seeing in the background is research that he conducted in the IBHS laboratory in North Carolina. Um, uh, this is research looking at the different types of materials and vulnerabilities that we find in structures, learning how structures ignite from embers during wildfires. What you see now are unprotected eave vents 
in a, a typical home, you can see the embers passing right through the vents into the attic space of, of the home, potentially igniting the home. This is, a, this is a demonstration building. Also in the same laboratory, the left-hand side of the building is built from what we would consider to be ordinary materials, wood shingle siding, a deck that's constructed the way most decks are, redwood decking with no protection for the joists beneath it, uses bark mulch right up against the side of the house, has plantings, plants that are too close to the siding of the house. The right-hand side is built to California's current building code. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. Uses gravel mulch, uses foil-faced bitumen backing on top of the, the deck joists with, jo with deck boards that are spaced wider apart. Simple features, just minor changes to the way a home is built um, uh, that make a dramatic difference. There were no ignitions, nothing on the right-hand side ignited during this laboratory test. So when we look at houses, we're looking at vulnerabilities. Uh, we start at the roof. The roof is the most vulnerable part of the house. Your eaves are vulnerable, vents, siding. Your windows can be vulnerable. Uh, if they're single paned, we prefer to see dual pane tempered glass windows. The mulch around the exterior of the house that comes right up to the side of the house is incredibly important in deciding whether your home will survive or not and your deck is important. We're gonna cover each of those real briefly, just give you an introduction before we get into zone zero, the real topic tonight. We can't emphasize enough how important your roof is. We don't see wood shingle or shake roofs in Marin often anymore. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, 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 they've been uh, essentially outlawed since the early 1990s, since just after the Oakland Hills fire. Um, <laughs> but uh, a wood shake roof, there are still a few of them out there because wood shake roofs can last up to 80 years. Um, incredibly vulnerable. Uh, if you've got a wood shingled roof, you've got to think about replacing it. Uh, there are options like metal roofs, uh, composition shingle roofs that are much more fire resistant. They're rated to what's called the class A standard. Um, uh, uh, resistant to igniting from embers and, and resistant to igniting even if other materials that are on the roof ignite. Um, however, here's a photograph. This is an illustration provided by Dr. Quarles uh, that, that illustrates a composition shingle roof built to the Class A standard. This roof alone, the roof sheathing, could withstand an ignition. It could withstand embers landing on it. But when you see a huge buildup of leaves on the roof, or when you have vulnerable places like where the vertical siding, the wood shingle siding in this case, meets the horizontal surface of the roof, you've got a vulnerability that, that the fire will overcome. You've got to keep your roof spotlessly clean at all times, especially in the fall when fire season's at its worst. And that this is a you know, really good illustration of one of what would otherwise be a relatively safe home's biggest vulnerability. Even some roof types that uh, are essentially invulnerable can be built in such a way that, that, uh, uh, that they can be threatened by embers during a wildfire. Here's uh, an image on the right-hand side is a tile roof, terracotta tiles with bird stops that for some reason were not completed. The bird stops are, are uh, you know, the, the filling that encloses the ends that prevents birds from building nests under the tiles. They also keep embers from blowing up underneath the tiles themselves. And any gap or space that could allow an ember to blow up and underneath the roof cover covering is uh, a cause for concern. We wanna protect the vents on homes. Vent homes have to breathe. The vents that allow air in and out of the house can also allow embers in and out of the house if they aren't screened properly. Oftentimes we see vents like this where, where the screening that's on the vent, in this case, this is a nice fine wire mesh screen, but it's been cut to allow, uh, it looks like telephone wires or a grounding wire to pass through. That's extremely common. Where, where that screening has been cut, uh, you've created a vulnerability. Here's another one where the screening's been cut. This is a quarter inch wire mesh, which is uh, the openings on this screen are too large to begin with. They're large enough to allow embers to pass through. The laboratory research has shown that one eighth inch or smaller screening is best to stop embers from traveling through those vents. Um, there are several engineered vents on the market. This one that's pictured here is by Vulcan Vents. There are two others are, are manufactured by Brandguard um, and Embers Out. 
They're approved by the state of California, the state fire marshal for use in new construction in wildfire prone areas, the wildland urban interface. Um, fantastic products, all of them that can really help protect your home. In this case, this particular vent, the Vulcan vent, will actually close off entirely to prevent even heat or flames from passing through into the interior spaces of your house if it's exposed to heat or flames. And it will stop just about every ember that it's confronted with. This is what a Vulcan vent looks like when it's installed on exterior siding. That's fiber cement shingles there. Those are not wood shingles, they're impermeable. And this is a Vulcan vent installed in an eave in the same home. Um, all, all of these features uh, I want, want to emphasize are, are, are uh, covered by California's current building code. Chapter 7A of the California Building Code covers the wildland urban interface. Any home that's built or rebuilt in the wildland urban interface in California since 2008 is built to this standard. Um, I, What's important about it, and a, a, a statistic that illustrates the importance, is that during the campfire, when 12,450 homes burned, if your home was built after 2008, 51% of those homes survived. Of the homes that were built before 2008, only about 18% survived. Um, I, 2008 was the magic year because that's the year that this, this chapter 7a of the building code was adopted in the state of California. Tremendous difference, almost three times the number of homes built to that standard survive. Um, and we expect that to be true just about anywhere in the state. It, it works, uh, it's an effective way to protect homes during even the worst wildfires. Um, as we, we look at homes, there are some simple things that homeowners can do to protect their homes. Even installing things like those or retrofitting those vents uh, can be done by most homeowners. But this is a simple thing that, that just about anybody can do, almost a no cost upgrade. Just maintaining your home, sealing gaps and cracks, um, uh, caulking around windows, and any gap or crack bigger than about an eighth of an inch can potentially uh, attract embers, which can get lodged into that space and ignite when the winds of the fire blow air against it during a fire. Uh, the gaps and cracks can also allow embers into the inside of your walls, into interior spaces, uh, a vulnerability you might not have been aware of. So just, uh, just right, routine maintenance, making sure you've got your house painted and caulked and well cared for can make a big difference. There are other vulnerabilities, skylights, eaves, uh, decks and porches, doors and windows, your, the siding we talked about briefly, your yard and garden structures and outbuildings are all potential vulnerabilities. We've got a tremendous amount of information at Fire Safe Marin's website. Um, uh, your building officials, your local fire inspector can help you understand what upgrades can be made to your home to uh, better protect it. If you were to build a new home, your architects and builders will understand that and they have to build it to the current standard. Um, I, we get a lot of questions before we move to the next topic. I wanna cover this. A lot of questions about uh, the cost of home hardening. Uh, this is a, a study out of Headwaters Economics. Dr. Quarles helped write this study. Um, it, it shows that the cost of building a home to California's building standard is essentially no more expensive than building homes the traditional methods. Not only are these homes more durable and more resistant to igniting from wildfires, um, but there's really no additional cost to building to that standard. <clears throat> so what we want to talk about are things that a homeowner can do, simple, inexpensive, inexpensive changes to their home. We want to talk to you about uh, identifying some of the most basic vulnerabilities that your home might be faced with tonight. I hope that when people uh, you know, leave this presentation, you, may, you walk around the out exterior of your house, take a close look at uh, you know, some of the things we talk about, and make a couple changes even tonight. I'll show you how. We've talked for years about defensible space. Um, defensible space is a term that's been used since the late 1960s in California. It uh, describes the maintenance in the space outside of your home that's required to protect your home from wildfires. The defensible part, uh, defensible part refers to the fact that firefighters uh, uh, need to be there to defend your home. That is part of the defensible uh, space uh, uh, doctrine and concept. Um, 
I, it, we can't emphasize enough that this is required by law and has been. There have been laws on the books in Marin County since the 1930s requiring some form of management of defensible space outside of your home. It started with uh, requirements to cut grasses outside of your home, and now there are even more in-depth requirements covering the space within 100 feet of any structure in the wildland urban interface. When we talk about defensible space, it's helpful to think about it divided into zones, changing, uh, changing requirements the further one gets from the home itself. We divide this up into the, these uh, three zones, or really four. Uh, zone zero, which is from zero to five feet around the outside of your structure. Zone one, which is five feet to 30 feet from any structure. Zone two is 30 to 100 feet from the structure. And then beyond that, we, we get into really what's out in your community and open spaces. We also sometimes refer to the access zone, which is the area around roads and driveways that serve your house. Um, but tonight, we're really going to focus on zone zero, that zero to five foot zone. We sometimes refer to this as the non-combustible zone. It's the area that needs to be kept as resistant to, as possible to igniting from embers. Um, uh, it, this is an illustration of a home that's got a, a outstanding attention to detail in the, uh, the zone zero area, five feet around the structure. This, this home uses gravel mulch. It's situated on a hillside with the types of vegetation that we would expect to see burn during a wildfire. Um, on the right hand side of the screen is, is a home that's being inundated by embers along exposure. This is down in, in uh, Southern California during the Thomas fire uh, two years ago. Um, you can see that the embers are falling. They're being generated by burning mulch immediately adjacent to the house. The embers are collecting when, once they fall at the base of the walls. Uh, that's why this space is so important to protect. <clears throat> when we look at zone zero, the first place we need to focus on and what we really need to, to think about and understand is that space right at the base of exterior walls. That's where those embers collect. That's where the mulch and other materials, leaf litter that's fallen out of trees will tend to collect at the base uh, of your walls. And that's where those embers will ignite that material. We wanna provide some vertical separation between the ground and the siding of your house that can ignite. Uh, about six inches of separation is all that's needed, the research has shown, uh, to protect the siding of your house from igniting from those embers. Unfortunately, a lot of times we've got bark mulch or, or uh, you know, shredded bark, uh, compost, other materials that can potentially ignite right up against the siding of the house. If that ignites, even if you've got a, a, a relatively ignition resistant exterior wall covering like stucco or fiber cement siding, oftentimes there's an exposed lip underneath that siding where the plywood sheathing may be exposed or even gaps that lead to the inside of the walls can be exposed if they ignite from burning material on the ground. So providing at least a six inch vertical separation is important and making sure that nothing can ignite within five feet of that wall, incredibly important. Um, when we're talking about mulch in that five foot zone, zero to five feet, we need everybody to think about replacing what they've got right now with non-combustible materials. Um, gravel, decomposed granite, pebbles, stone, even bare ground are far better choices than a combustible mulch. We really want to avoid any of the shredded barks like gorilla hair, but anything that could potentially ignite um, uh, uh, for mulch should be removed. Mulch is important. Mulches uh, hold moisture in the ground. They contribute to soil health and to moisture in the plants, which are all important things. Uh, but the ignition of those, the ignition of the mulch itself by embers uh, is one of the big contributors to home losses during fires. So we want to encourage you to consider gravel. If you need to use mulch, bark mulch or shredded uh, or uh, wood chips in your garden, we want you to look for the larger chips, larger bark, a half inch or greater. Um, and then again, avoid shredded bark or the gorilla hairs. <clears throat> in the zero to five foot zone, 
you still need to focus on your roof. Take a look at, at your roof. You wanna cut back any limbs that overhang your roof. We don't wanna see any limbs growing within 10 feet of your roof, but certainly any that intrude within five feet ought to be pruned back, um, largely because of the leaf litter and material that those trees will drop onto your roof. Uh, it can be difficult to keep up with cleaning your roof in the fall when leaves are falling and when wildfire season's at its worst. So keeping your roof spotlessly clean your first step. Again, same image you saw before, but pay the closest attention to areas where a vertical surface like a wall or a dormer meets the horizontal surface of the roof. Take a close look around your house. We want you to look for any common combustibles, anything that can burn within five feet of the structure. Um, we want you to look for things as simple as your doormat, your choice of doormat. This is a common one. That these, these jute doormats usually have an oak tree on them. They say, well, there may be natural fire and grass can ignite, will ignite there's land on them. Uh, during the months, fire season, move these doormats inside. Put them on a shelf in your garage. Um, get them away from the door and use a, a rubber mat or a metal grate or no doormat at all. Take a look at your patio furniture. Wood patio furniture is a poor choice. Um, we want to choose metal, cast aluminum, cast iron furniture over wood or wicker patio furniture. Look at the plants within five feet of your home. A choice of uh, uh, juniper in this case in a, a pot is, is a poor choice for the, uh, uh, you know, the pro close proximity to your home. Look for things like privacy screens and curtains. Oftentimes we see bamboo screens used on decks to give yourself some shielding from your neighbors. Uh, they're, they're not good choices within five feet of your structure on a deck or attached to your house. Look for things like stored firewood. Um, if you've got firewood stored within five feet of your house, you need to consider moving it indoors, move it into your garage, or move it away from your house, 30 feet at a minimum. Um, and I, I always say, and it's true, uh, uh, don't move it closer to your neighbor's house. Uh, and the best option is only to burn that firewood during the winter when we have a burn window and make sure that you don't store any firewood over the dry season. Um, we want you to, to uh, well, let me see, if we, I lost an image here, but um, th this is an example. This is actually the home that we showed earlier in Napa County. This is uh, the patio furniture on the exterior. So you can see uh, and it look like cigarettes, but these are large embers landed on the patio furniture igniting them. These are the types of embers that can land on any material outside of the home, combustible in the home. Example, the fire in California of a jute fiber doormat was at somebody's front door. You can see where the doormat was. It ignited from embers, scorched that. Thankfully, um, uh, it, it did not ignite the front door, but you can imagine your surprise opening your front door and finding that your doorstep is on fire and uh, you lose your home because of your choice of doormat and an otherwise fire resistant, ignition resistant home. This looking for this is uh, uh, really common. We've got recycling cans outside of our homes. They're oftentimes stuffed full of Amazon boxes, um, especially right now during COVID-19 when we're seeing lots of additional deliveries to homes. Uh, these materials should either be inside those cans and the cans themselves are combustible. They're made from plastics. During a red flag warning, during a, any type of wildfire weather or fire event, these cans should be moved away from the house or even preferably indoors. Um, this is a choice of uh, a poor choice of potted plants for a window box. Um, these are junipers and other combustible plants in somebody's window box on a house that has wood shingle siding. Uh, it's some just vulnerability that you might not be aware of. You might not be thinking well, if embers were those plants, there's really no chance that this house survived the water. Biggest vulnerability to stop thinking of decks as storage is we understand it's convenient and California are pressed decks to keep 
spotless will get into this space and ignite those materials. And, and at that point, very little can be done to protect the home. We want to encourage screening. In this case, this is a 1 8 inch wire mesh uh, hardware cloth screen that's been applied to the underside of the deck. You can see through the screen, you can see that they've uh, used gravel to protect the ground underneath the deck. Um, so there's gravel mulch up to the house and gravel mulch for five feet around the outside of the deck screening itself, leading to where the bark mulch begins. This is a, just a fantastic feature. Prevents embers from blowing into that space underneath the deck. Prevents animals from nesting and doing their thing underneath the deck. And it, and it really discourages the homeowner from being tempted to store materials underneath the deck. Fences are vulnerable. Uh, during the North Bay fires, we saw dozens, if not hundreds of homes that burned from their fences. The fences ignite from embers, from leaf litter that's blown up against the base of the fence. The fences usually terminate in the side of the house where the, your wooden gate uh, you know, accesses your side yard attached to your fence. We call that gate an attachment to the house. Uh, the fire will travel along the wooden fence ignite the gate where it's attached to the house and eventually burn to the house up underneath your eaves and ignite the house. Um, so we don't want to see a wooden fence attached to your house, but we understand that you need fences and that you need a gate to access your yard. Where the wooden fence attaches to your house, we'd much rather see a non-combustible gate, something like an iron gate, a metal gate is a much better choice. So choosing a non-combustible gate to provide access to your yard is, is far preferable to a wooden fence gate. Alternatively, there is an option to <clears throat> open that gate, prop it open during a wildfire event. If you were asked to evacuate your home or if you chose to evacuate your home uh, during a wildfire uh, following the steps that we taught in our first webinar, we'd like to see you on your way out of the house prop that gate open. It provides firefighters a clear sight access down the side of your house so that they can see if materials in your side yard or backyard have ignited. Um, it lets them know that that gate's unlocked if they need to go to the back side of your house to protect it. And, and it, it provides a fuel break. It, it breaks up the continuity of the fuel, which is your fence, and prevents it from burning to the house itself. Our next presentation uh, is, uh, is not scheduled. We are going to hold a webinar. It'll be hosted by the UC Master Gardeners the, uh, and FireSafe Marin. It's going to be called the FireSafe Fire Smart Landscaping uh, webinar. Uh, we expect to post it online at FireSafe Marin's website sometime in the next week. It'll cover topics of landscaping, plant selection, hardscaping. It'll show you how uh, landscape design can potentially protect your home from the heat, flames, and embers of a wildfire. And it'll show you that you can have a beautiful, healthy, well-maintained landscape around your home that's fire smart, fire resistant. Um, so we did, we, we were able to wrap this up in about 40 minutes, but I'd love to take questions. I've seen a number of uh, questions pop up on the Q&A. Um, John and, uh, and Rich, you want to lead a Q&A session? Sure, we can do that. Let's see if we can pull up the first questions here. Okay, so uh, Devorah asked, uh, what about garden tool plastic short storage sheds around the exterior house walls? That's a great question. We see it all the time. Um, storage sheds, plastic sheds uh, in particular are vulnerable. They're a combustible material. Probably uh, in some ways less of a risk than a wood shed, a little more difficult to ignite, but once those plastics do ignite from uh, might, might be from leaf litter at the base of the, the storage shed, or if they ignite for another reason, they'll burn intensely. The, those uh, plastics contain volatile hydrocarbons, oils that burn hot. So what we'd like to see is uh, non-combustible storage sheds or moving those sheds away from the house. Uh, we know that that can be difficult sometimes, but it's a vulnerability you need to be thinking about. If moving it away from the house isn't an option, then a plastic shed is probably a better 
choice than a wooden shed and you need to keep the base of it absolutely spotlessly clean at all times during fire season. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Todd, take a look at the uh, answered questions. Devora had another question. I gave a quick typed answer, but she's asking about uh, potted succulents. Maybe you can expand on okay. that. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, potted succulents within five feet. If, if you're going to put any plants within five feet of the structure, succulents are a great choice. Um, uh, that said, Fire Safe Marin specifically does not recommend any vegetation at all within five feet of a structure. Uh, I, we understand that people are going to have plants in that area. So if you're going to, then choosing uh, succulents, cho choosing uh, you know, uh, flowering plants, herbs that have uh, moist leaves are better choices. We want to cover the, the topic of plant selection, though, in much better detail and from the real experts with the UC Marin Master Gardeners. That'll be in our next session, and everybody who attended this session tonight We'll receive an invitation to that. We'll post it online at Facebook and uh, on our website as well. Expect that. Todd, David Ernst has a question. Uh, he has his hand raised. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing that question, but I'm going to go through. Okay, David Ernst, there we go. Propane tanks and, and grills, uh, where to position and store. So propane tanks themselves, if your home is served by a large propane tank, you need to protect that. You should consider that like any other structure, make sure there are no combustibles. Uh, the fire code requires a little greater clearance around a propane tank. They wanna see 10 feet of non-combustible zone around the exterior of a propane tank. Um, so you shouldn't build wooden screens to try to screen those tanks. Um, uh, and, and you need to cut grasses, make sure they're kept clean, make sure there's no leaf litter built up underneath them. Portable propane tanks and grills, uh, different story. They are relatively safe as long as you're storing them with the gas valve shut off. The rubber hose is vulnerable and if the rubber hose were to burn while the gas tank is turned on, it would be an uncontrolled stream of propane. You're probably gonna lose your house. Uh, as long as that gas, that the propane tank valve is shut, it's relatively safe and you can have it on a deck um, or close to the house. That said, we'd rather see you move it inside the house during a wildfire or more than 30 feet away from yours or any other house. Um, so Jim Casper uh, has, has uh, submitted really more of a comment, but, but he's asking us to, to stress and recommend the, what are recommended actions versus required actions. So a lot of what we talked about tonight is not required by the fire code. Those, those measures, the vulnerabilities in the zero to five foot zone zero, non-combustible zone, are not required by law typically. The fire code, whether it's uh, Public Resources Code 4291, or in Marin County, the adopted fire code, um, uh, the California Fire Codes, Chapter uh, 4907.2 of the fire code, uh, addresses vegetation and maintenance outside of the home. It requires you to clean up any dead leaf litter, any dead material that collects on the ground within 100 feet or to your property line of any structure requires you to remove any dead plants on your property within 100 feet of any structure, requires you to cut dry grasses during the summer, uh, and generally maintain your yard. It does not specifically address things like the choice of natural fiber doormats. It does not address things like uh, recycling cans under the eaves, does not require you to screen the underside of existing decks. These are all things that we think will make a huge impact on your home's ability to survive a wildfire, but that aren't required. So the specific requirements in your neighborhood and jur or jurisdiction are, are an issue that you should address with your fire department. In general, it's maintenance and removal of any dead plants, um, limbing up trees, spacing your choice of landscaping plants. But uh, these types of issues in the zone zero are not required by law they'll make just as big a diff uh, impact on your home survival as the other items, so. Uh, Todd, we have two live uh, questions, one from Nadine and one from David. So David, you need, you need to unmute yourself. Great. 
Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, you want me to go ahead because I'm unmuted? Um, I, I wrote this in the chat box. Uh, I couldn't tell from that picture of the screening example you got for underneath the uh, deck area. For my deck, we have to be able to get underneath it because I think there's probably um, a plumbing and, and clear clean out for sewages and stuff like that. So how, how is that done? If you screen it, is there some way that you can also enter under it when needed? Yeah, absolutely. So th this deck, it's not pictured, but this uh, deck actually had multiple doors in, in the screen. So, so they're hinged doors that they can open. Those hinged doors, they built them in such a way so that they're, they're sealed with weather stripping, just like an exterior door, but, but not to keep the weather out, it's to keep embers out. So there, there are, are entrances into this space. And you can see if you, if you can uh, you know, see th through that image, um, there's an air conditioner and, and other exterior features that need to be maintained, plumbing as well. So they made sure to build this with access to that space. Is the door metal or is the door wood? The I door is a wood saying. frame that's actually screened with the same wire mesh. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. And David, uh, Ernst, did you have a question there? Okay, we can move on, I guess, to the open questions, Todd. Thanks. Sure. So I'm going to answer uh, Nick's question. Nick, Nick's asking uh, what we're thinking about the relative risk this fire season. Is it higher than normal, average, lower? Um, I, uh, this, my opinion, and I think this is probably backed up by just about everybody in the professional fire service, we feel that the risk is significantly higher this year for a variety of reasons. Um, one, we are, we're seeing what are really, in a lot of ways, catastrophic drought conditions in Northern California. Our rainfall was uh, approaching record low levels. Our snowpack is among the lowest that it's ever been recorded at this time. Um, we, so we see some conditions that normally contribute to terrible wildfires happening right now. There's not a lot of discussion about it because we're dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, that said, uh, I would expect that COVID-19 itself will affect the fire service's ability to respond to fight fires. I think it's likely that small fires will grow larger than they normally would as fewer resources might be available statewide for uh, firefighting. It's going to be much more difficult for the fire service to assemble fire camps with thousands of firefighters to fight the big fires that we see almost every year in California. So uh, there are a number of factors adding up that could make this year uh, extreme. And I, I don't say that lightly. I, I, most fire fringe when news every year, uh, you know, the, the media says the worst ever. True, but it's big. Number of predictable factors happening this year that, that really extreme. Um, Kathleen, Cutters asked a question. She says, is getting sprinklers installed, she, uh, she's considering getting sprinklers installed on the roof. She's wondering if way to um, and is there an issue of uh, well, sprinklers using water that could otherwise be available to firefighters? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, there are cases where sprinklers on a roof might be effective. We don't ordinarily recommend them. They're not a good option for everybody. Um, one of the reasons they're not ever usually expensive than a new roof, and if you've got a roof that's built from fire resistant materials, a class A roof, and you've got uh, ignition resistant siding on things like dormers, and you've got good flashing around, uh, around uh, skylights and good flashing on the edges of the roofs, that's probably more effective than a sprinkler system on a combustible roof. It's almost certainly more effective. So the, they can be, the sprinkler systems can be expensive. They're not any more effective usually than simply building a ignition resistant roof. That said, there are some homes that are difficult to protect. There are some situations where we think that a sprinkler system can be a good option. It should be one that's installed by somebody who understands wildfire. Uh, the company that we, we work with, we, we, we don't take recommendations of particular businesses uh, lightly here, but there is a company, Frontline Fire Defense. Um, they install a, a very well thought out, well engineered sprinkler system for roofs and eaves in the exterior of homes that uh, we think can be a, a good option for homeowners who can afford it and who live in particular situations that are really vulnerable. 
Um, uh, that said, uh, it, it can, they can be shockingly expensive uh, in some cases. It may well be worth it to you, especially with the high value of homes in Marin and the Bay Area. So it's certainly worth looking into and frontline uh, fire defense is the one company we'd recommend reaching out to. And who installs those systems as well. Todd, uh, Rich and Bridget Clark are live with a question. Great, thank you. Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I've got three questions really. First okay. one is that um, um, we bought a house about six years ago and in 2011, it had a fire and there was a major rebuild <laughs> by Dennis Rodoni and um, and the uh, roof is a class A approved wood shake roof that was signed off by the county and was a state approved class A wood shake at the time. Do I have to replace that? You might not like this answer. Um, uh, uh, and, and there are a number of caveats. We ought to have a discussion offline, but I want to answer this. Uh, the, the coatings that are applied to treated shingles to make them pass the Class A uh, ember ignition test uh, wear off eventually. Now the coatings on all roofs eventually can fail, especially things like composition uh, tiles. Uh, that said, composition shingles, that we think that the coatings that are applied to wood shake roofs are more vulnerable to weathering and wear and tear than, than other materials, and we think that, uh, you know, in your case, you're now looking at a 10 plus year old uh, weathered wood shingle roof. Um, it, it may well be vulnerable. Uh, I can't answer that sp specifically. I can't see your roof. You'd have to take a close look at it, but I do not think that your roof is as well protected as you might assume, and it's certainly not as well protected, for example, as a metal roof where the coating that wears off or is weathered is not uh, part of its fire protection. Um, so uh, it's not our first choice. There are a number of fire code officials in Marin who wish that those roofs were not allowed in Marin. Not every jurisdiction in Marin allows them. Um, uh, and uh, you, you have one, you need to think about protecting that roof. You, you know, you might, you might be one of those people that ought to consider either replacing that roof or installing a sprinkler system. And you absolutely need to keep your roof spotlessly clean at all times during fire season. We're in fire season right now. Uh, when it gets to be September and October and leaves are falling, you've really got to work hard. It might be a full-time job to keep your roof clean enough to protect it. So. That's a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope. Uh, no, that's what I was afraid I was going to hear. Yeah. Um, can I get a, a like an educational inspection that <laughs> that won't compromise me, where I have to do immediate replacements? Um, so, so I first of all, the, the most none of really none of the fire agencies in Marin will do an inspection that requires any immediate replacement of uh, parts of your house you you I can't say that you can get an educational inspection from your fire department that might not trigger a requirement uh, for a fire code violation which would be vegetation around your home so okay. if the fire department comes over to inspect your property and to give you an education uh, inspection and they see that you've got dry grass burning uh, growing right up against the side of the house they're almost certainly going to tell you that you need to cut the grass all of the fire agencies in Marin want this to be a cooperative process Nobody joined the fire department to write tickets or to get in law enforcement. They would have gone into a different career. If that's what they wanted to do, they want this to be cooperative. They want to educate you. We want to educate you. And we want you to make the choice to make the changes that need to be done. But I, so I, I'm not clear on whether you're asking, uh, you know, would, would, if they show up, are they going to make you fix your roof? No, they're not going to do that. That's not a requirement. The next time you replace your roof, uh, depending on how long it lasts, you may need to choose a different material for it. Uh, okay. But that, that would happen when you get a building permit. And you're going to have something on uh, landscaping. I, we're in an area where there's a lot of uh, trees within 30, well, within 100 feet for sure. Yeah. We're, we're going to have a presentation in the next week. We, do, we have not settled on the date and time for it. This is a whole new process and concept for us but we will have a presentation within the next week 
on uh, fire smart landscaping and it's going to be taught by the experts at the UC Marin Master Gardeners. Okay, thanks a lot. You, sure. You're really doing a good job. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> All right. So who's next here? Devora. Uh, Devora. Okay. So Devora, uh, you asked about what we were what we were talking about when we said that that something should be applied to the underside of decks. Uh, when a new deck is constructed, there are joists that hold the deck boards up. The the deck boards that you walk on have to rest on something that's called a joist. The top of those joists are vulnerable when embers get between the deck boards and land on the joist itself. They often ignite right there. There's a simple fix that a lot of builders will do to protect those joists from water damage, and it turns out it helps protect them from embers as well. They use a foil-faced bitumen uh, 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 adhesive tape that it covers the top side of those joists. It rests between the deck boards and the joist itself. It keeps the deck, deck boards from squeaking, protects from moisture, and protects from embers. It's extremely inexpensive to apply when a new deck is being built or if you have to replace the deck boards on an existing deck. Um, so foil face bitumen on top of the joists is what we're, we're talking about. Great option to help protect your deck. Sue asked, uh, can we speak more on the larger size diameter wood bark uh, mulch being okay in the five foot zone? So we don't think that any wood bark or wood chips are okay during the in that five foot zone. I apologize, I stumbled over my words a bit there. Still getting used to a, a reorganized slide presentation. There should not be any bark or wood chip mulches at all in the five foot zone. We wanna see only non combustible materials that can't burn. Where it's okay to use the larger diameter bark mulch is farther from the home when you're more than five feet from the home. So from five feet to 30 feet where you've got landscaping, uh, it, you're going to learn about in our next presentation, um, it's okay to use the larger bark mulch. We are still uh, very cautious. We don't recommend the use of the shredded bark mulch. It ignites too easily. It's what the Cub Scouts use to start their campfires, and we don't think it belongs in residential gardens in Northern California. Um, uh, as convenient as it is because it does stick on steeper slopes and it has some nice attributes, it holds moisture in the ground, but we think you should choose a larger half inch or larger bark or wood chip mulch. So uh, Kathleen's asked, is there an issue with moisture accumulating in the attic and basement with the vents being 1 16th of an inch or, or smaller? Um, is it advisable to move the, your fire arresting vents uh, in the winter to regular vents? Um, people might be concerned with mold. It's true, those vents are there to allow uh, moisture to escape your house. It's important for your house to breathe. Um, it's a great question. Retrofitting smaller screens onto existing vents can reduce the airflow into your house. Um, I, it's tough for us to know offhand without having a building engineer look at your home whether you have enough ventilation or too much ventilation or too little ventilation uh, currently. So uh, it's possible that retrofitting smaller vent screens won't have any effect at all on moisture buildup in your house. It's also possible that it will. So you should have, uh, you should talk to a builder who understands airflow and make sure that, that you're not doing something that could harm your home. Um, in uh, most cases, we, we simply have not seen any issues at all with moisture buildup though when these screens are retrofitted. So Lori is asking, can I get Todd's take on my question above? <coughs> Will putting gravel on top of a 12 to 18 inch deep bed of mulch and ferns make it non-combustible or do we need to remove the bed? Um, Putting gravel on top will probably make it more fire resistant. I'm having a little hard time picturing what this looks like. So you've got a, uh, an 18 inch deep bed of mulch and ferns. Um, if it's right up against your house, you probably want to try to remove as much of the combustible material as possible and put the gravel on top so that there is no combustible material exposed. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, feel free to reach out to me offline, either call or email. Um, Tom is asking, what about low flow sprinklers? 
these, uh, I, I'm not clear, we might be talking about irrigation uh, sprinklers, so probably not talking about fire sprinklers because those are not low flow by design. Uh, low flow sprinklers outside of the house can provide moisture. They do provide moisture. Uh, uh, that area, any place that's planted needs irrigation. Any moisture that's in the ground will help make things more resistant to igniting. Um, and there are times when sprinklers outside of a house can uh, uh, can help prevent embers from igniting. That said, and this this will go back to a part of Kathleen's question that I didn't answer, can water use affect the water that's available to firefighters? It, it can to some extent. If everybody in your neighborhood were to turn on their sprinklers at once, the water pressure can drop for the entire neighborhood. Um, we would rather see you choose non-combustible materials that you don't need to water to provide fire protection, especially in that five foot zone. So. Uh, Andrea asked, uh, thank you, she says, this is great. Thanks for the information. She's, she's uh, hoping to forward the recording of this to her association. So uh, the, the encouraging thing is it sounds like she's uh, watching this on Facebook, which we didn't think was working. So hopefully this is broadcast live on Facebook. Um, we will make a recording of this available on Facebook and we'll try to make a recording of this available on FireSafe Marin's website. We're also going to hold this same uh, webinar uh, relatively frequently. You'll see more, more options to attend uh, live in the near future. And Tom asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of gutter or roof mounted low flow sprinklers? Okay, so, so uh, um, uh, you know, that's really back to the question about roof sprinklers in general. Uh, when you install roof sprinklers uh, what, engineered by a company like Frontline Fire Defense, you really need to be choosing uh, the sprinklers based on what they need to do, where they need to reach, and the types of materials they're protecting. This is a system that's engineered, so I can't speak to low flow. Um, we want to use the right amount of water in those situations. You don't want to use too much water. You don't want to flood it. You don't want to drain the water, again, for the fire department. Um, so I, I don't know that I could recommend one way or the other without seeing your home, the flow rates of those sprinklers. You need to talk to a professional frontline fire defense or Ember Defense LLC or the people to reach out to with those questions. Lori's asking, is, it, uh, is dirt or clay soil without mulch combustible? Uh, no, it's not. Bare soil is not considered combustible. Um, usually uh, bare soil releases too much moisture. It dries out. It's not good for the plants. You do need some type of mulch. Gravel is the best way to hold moisture in the ground close to the house. Um, Jim, Jim Casper's uh, saying, well, water on the roof doesn't help the five foot zone. That's true. What water, uh, some of the sprinkler systems can be installed underneath the eaves of the house, which can help protect the eave and also drop water onto that five foot zone. Again, uh, we don't recommend sprinklers. I've talked more about sprinklers than I ever have before in any presentation tonight. Um, they're great questions, but what we would rather see is that you use materials that won't ignite to begin with, rather than try to protect them with water during a wildfire event. You can't count on being able to turn on those sprinkler systems all the time. Um, uh, you need to be able to operate them remotely, which can be an expensive uh, installation and undertaking. And you can't always count on your municipal water system. The water systems failed during the North Bay fires and the Oakland fire, the Camp fire. So, so we don't want you to rely on a water system that may or may not be there during the fire. Um, that said, that we've seen some of these systems installed by those companies installed with backup pumps, backup tanks, swim, swimming pool pumps. There are ways to do it, but they're heavily engineered and there are a lot of pieces that might not work right when you need it most. Oh, another uh, I, issue with uh, windows uh, uh, and with uh, sprinklers is that, uh, uh, you know, when a, when a window gets wet and it's very hot, then that water can break the... Uh, uh, can break the window. Yes. Yeah. So if windows are exposed to radiant heat from flames, from material that are burning <clears throat> nearby, or maybe a neighbor's home that's burning, if those windows get hot and then are contacted by water, firefighters have seen this over and over. I've seen it. But the window will shatter the moment the water hits it. So I, absolutely. Those good the companies that know how to install these systems, install them carefully and actually take steps to protect the windows so that the water won't hit the window. Um, uh, during the fire event. Uh, that's why you, you really don't want to try to install this yourself. You could cause more harm than good. 
Uh, so, Devorah is asking, when will Measure C crews be up and running to do inspections of, of homes in defensible space? I'll tell you, just before we started this presentation, I was in a meeting with the, uh, the, some of the crews and it, we're hiring firefighters right now, seasonal inspectors to do those inspections using funds from Measure C. So they're in the process. So they've hired uh, or offered jobs to dozens of inspectors already across the county. Um, there will be a unified inspection program from West Marin all the way through the Ross Valley to Corte Madera. Southern Marin uh, will be expanding their existing programs with new inspectors funded by Measure C. San Rafael and Nevada are developing programs as well that will be funded by Measure C to vastly expand their inspection capabilities this year. Um, I, it's going to be a good program. We will see uh, some uh, uh, you know, scales of uh, uh, efficiency in the coming year. This is a tough year. The, the JPA funding won't be available until July 1st, and we need to start the inspections before that. So there's, there's uh, you know, some unique stopgap measures that are going to be applied in 2020, and I think things will smooth out and be even more efficient and better next year. You're going to see a lot of work begin uh, after July of this year from Measure C fund, both inspection programs and then funding the, the actual project work to reduce wildfire risk in Marin. Looks like that's it for questions. No open questions. We really appreciate everybody attending. Again, uh, we're sorry we don't have a date and time to announce right now for the next program that's going to be Fire Smart Landscaping by the UC Marin Master Gardeners. It'll be hosted here at FireSafe Marin on our Zoom channel. Um, and we're going to uh, record that, post it online as well. And we'll turn this into a regular series. We'll also be host hosting sessions on community organizing in the FireWise USA program. I, and uh, you know, other topics of interest. Some of these pro programs will be like this, about an hour long. Some will be even shorter. And we also want to introduce people to our new uh, video series. We have a series of five minute videos that will be released over the coming weeks. The very first one was released today. It's a six minute video uh, produced by FireSafe Marin and the UC Marin Master Gardeners on Fire Smart Landscaping. It's a real brief introduction, uh, uh, you know, an overview of what will be covered in the webinar, uh, but it's, it's a, a fantastic video. We're really happy with the results and the partnership with the Master Gardeners. It's available on our YouTube channel uh, right now and on Facebook, and, and uh, we'll be posting a link to it on our website in the coming days. So take a look at that. Our brand oh, and you have one more question. Okay, we got a new Rich, question. Rich, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, do we sign up for those major C um, inspections or, you know, for someone to come out and take a look at our place? How does that work? Right now, they're not signups. They're going to be inspections that will be scheduled by the fire department. They won't be scheduled individually. They're going to be out in neighborhoods inspecting the most vulnerable properties. They will not be inspecting every property every year in Marin. They'll be on most locations will be on about a two to three year cycle for inspections. Um, so you may see an inspection this year. The most vulnerable properties will probably be addressed this year and then uh, uh, other properties next year. So okay. you're definitely going to see inspectors out in the field, but right now I'm not aware of any, any uh, hotline that you can call to request an individual inspection. I think going forward, uh, certainly after this first year where we're getting our feet under us, you're going to see options to call and request a, uh, an evaluation of your property. So that, that'll be with your, your local fire department. You'll reach out to your local fire department's Fire Prevention Bureau. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, oh, great. Thanks everybody for attending. Really appreciate you all being here. Oh, we'll send out invitations to the next programs and, and uh, Rich and John and I'll stick around for a few more minutes if anybody's got any more questions and wants to interact. But we're going to we're going to stop the uh, the Facebook live sharing right now and we'll see you all at the next one. So it looks like we're wrapping up here. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if I, there we go, stop recording.